Hello! Uh, we left off in the classroom discussion as part of the video lecture uh, with a discussion of the properties of the mind and body and how that ties into Cartesian dualism. That section of the class was focused on metaphysics and I would like to bring this back to an epistemological sort of perspective. And to do that I have invited all of you into my home where uh, we're going to finish up this discussion on meditations and first philosophy. Now, in the video lecture, we had covered one of the proofs of the existence of God, when in fact Descartes has two proofs for the existence of God. A rational proof, starting from this concept of I think, therefore I am, uh, was very, very important, because he could discuss then his thoughts, and his thoughts were, as it occurs to him, uh, a concept of God. So there is a direct bridge between his casting everything away in doubt, having one thing that is not able to be doubted, and then building on that one thing that is not able to be doubted. And so he comes to his second proof for the existence of God. And that is of God and his existence as it pertains to even the very definition of God. He says that God is a being that is wholly perfect. Now, you might take issue with Descartes at this point and say, well, in my belief system, God is not entirely perfect in all ways. And at that point, Descartes will stop you and say, well, you understand that what you're talking about is changing the definition of God. What we're doing is we're talking about who God is as the definition is. Now, when you start talking about this being that is not entirely perfect, you're not talking about God you're talking about something else. What we're talking about is God. And so God is a being that is wholly perfect, that is perfect in all ways, perfect in all manners and in all attributes. So therefore, his existence is something that he has also perfected. So God, being perfect in his existence, therefore must logically exist. And Descartes believes that this is conclusive proof for the existence of God. Many of you may take issue with that, and you may feel free in the discussion boards, as many philosophers throughout history have attacked his logic or attacked his premises. So, this being where, they, where he is, he says that God's existence being proven, uh, we can also know that God as a perfect being is also no deceiver because something that is perfect in all ways is also perfect in his goodness. And since God is perfect in his goodness, God is not going to deceive us. So this goes back all the way to uh, some of the other sections on Meditations on First Philosophy, where Descartes had ruled out mathematical and rational understanding, because now he knows that there is no evil deceiver, but God as a good being and God as somebody who is not a deceiver. So, now that he's tackled this concept of rational mathematical knowledge, he can now move on to tackle sensation, because it is clear that he has sensation. He never doubted that he had sensation. It's the reliability of that sensation that he doubted. So, we have this sensation. Now, if this sensation was placed directly in our minds by God, making it appear as though there were physical things when there are not, then that would make God a deceiver. And he says, God is no deceiver. Therefore, those physical things that we think we see must occur not to the mind, but to something else. It must occur to the sensory organs of the body, to the nerves of the fingers of the tongue, of inside the nose, the ears, the eyes. So, we can determine that there is some sort of rush, some sort of connection between this mind and body, that this external existence occurs to the body, and then that information is transferred to the mind. Now, what about the reliability of those things? He had already mentioned earlier that our eyes sometimes deceive us. Our smell deceives us. What of those instances? Well, 
what he says is that our mental faculties exist to help accommodate for some of those problems. God has given us our mental faculties to work upon those sensations and analyze them and help us come to an understanding of when they are flawed. For example, there was one time I was doing a lot of work out in the heat of the sun. And as I was doing this lawn work, a brown car started to drive by. And just because of all the heat, I had a, I started to have a hallucination. I'd been working too hard for too long without enough to drink and so on and so forth. And it appeared to me as though this car turned into a hawk and swooped at my head. Now, did I run screaming into the house that cars were turning into birds and trying to attack me? Obviously not. I had a rational mind that could work upon that sensation and inform me that this sensation was false. What did also inform me is that I needed to go down, cool down in the air conditioning, and get a glass of water, which I did. That is the purpose of these faculties. And so, God has given us these faculties and these, these organs that are capable of perception, and since God is no deceiver, they are more or less reliable. And the faculties help us understand when the eyes and the ears and all of our other senses are not going completely right. So, he says that nonetheless, there is a close conjunction between this physical body and the non-physical mind. We'll get on to later in the semester where we'll discuss these as two different substances. And the Cartesian dualism, where there is mind and body, is a matter of there being two substances, a non-physical substance and a physical substance, mind and body. So these two substances, these two separate things, are nonetheless working in conjunction, even though they are distinct, and even though they are different, they are functioning as a unified thing. So the, it's through the physical, and though the, uh, the physical and non-physical are different, Descartes brings us to his understanding of what the mind is, uh, what knowledge is, and what the body is. And since he has understood all these things, he can say that we can observe the world around us and understand that what we see through our senses are in fact more or less reliable, and we can trust them, and we can use them for further study and further research, which was one of the unstated purposes of his work. So, this concludes our discussion of the Meditations on First Philosophy. If you have any questions, please feel free to bring them up in the board.